should be working. Yes, it seems to be. So the question is, why Rome? Uh, why will we spend four lectures here on Rome? And I think one of the reasons is simply the number of cities they built. Uh, this is a partial list of cities that are still with us, that are still uh, living cities today, not ghost towns, that are, in fact, um, were built by the Romans. Or, as in the case of, say, Athens, were completely rebuilt um, under a sort of separate set of rules that they had under a classification of cities they call polii. Um, and other cities like Jerusalem, which had been destroyed uh, when Jerusalem was sacked in 71 A.D., was rebuilt as the city of Elia Capitolina in 130 and then renamed under Constantine in the 4th century Jerusalem. Uh, so the old city of Jerusalem, um, as I mentioned, when you walk down the Souk Zeit or the Street of Chains between the Alpha Gate and the Temple Mount, you're walking down the Cardo, the Roman Cardo, and the Roman Decumanus. Um, this just is a partial list that I was able to put together. Uh, it's even more than this. They built thousands of cities and um, thus it is um, important that we understand uh, the legacy that they left because it influences so much that comes after it. As I said the other day, and I will repeat now, um, no matter where it started out, by the time it gets to us in the Western world, it bears an indelible Roman stamp, and it has been strained through a Roman filter. Um, if we take uh, the initial stake in the ground that I put forth on the first day of class, where does Fifth and West Peachtree come from? We have to ask, where do numbered streets and streets named after trees come from? They come from Philadelphia. Where does Penn get the idea for that? Um, it's actually from a series of treatises on the ideal city that came out of the Italian Renaissance. Um, where the, what are the sources for those authors? It is Vitruvius. Uh, Vitruvius was a bit of a hick. Uh, he is, as Alberti described, the only, the sole survivor of this vast shipwreck. A man who wrote Greek such that we would think him Latin and Latin such that we would think him a Greek, so that for us it would have been best if he had written nothing at all. all right? That's uh, quoting Alberti, who is translating um, the fragmentary texts of Vitruvius, the only text that we have on architecture from, um, and in that only one small portion of one chapter, one book, um, that um, describes cities. And it's pretty clear when you read that, that uh, and you compare that to the knowledge that we have from other authors, that he was not um, well clued in, as we might say. There's a tendency in the way that um, history is taught, including this course, to think of the Greeks. I was taught this in high school. It, was, it took me a long time to unlearn it, uh, that the Greeks sort of developed civilization in the West, and they developed democracy. And then the Romans came along and conquered them and took it all, and um, that was that, right? And so everything that was Roman was a sort of debased form of Greek, which is not true. Um, they're related, and there is a point in the first, second centuries A.D. where this kind of merges into what we really ought to call Mediterranean civilization, which is a kind of merger uh, in the whole Mediterranean world of Greek elements, Egyptian elements, Roman elements, so on and so forth. I mean, the practice of deifying uh, an emperor, for example, came from Egypt, the deification of the pharaoh. Um, so... It's really one civilization, but the Romans developed independently, completely independently. And so I put together this timeline so that you can see um, Rome here in red, founded in, according to tradition, to their own traditions in 753, actually April the 21st, 753 BCE. And we see down here the founding of these Greek colonies in Italy much later. And then if we come down here to the classical Hellenic city of the 5th century, uh, Rome has been going for 250 years at that point. Now, it's not much of a city at that point. Um, it will develop into certainly the largest city 
uh, in the ancient world by a factor of 10, uh, with a population by the 4th century of over a million people. Um, I've also put up this timeline because Rome is not simply one thing. It is a, um, a city that develops um, uniquely in the ancient world uh, as a political association. Every other city that we've seen, every other culture that we've discussed, uh, basically is derived in the way that Aristotle is describing it, from a sort of familial, tribal origin that then builds up into something larger that he calls a village and then eventually into what he calls the state, um, which is independent of that. That is the point where that political association is formed. Rome, uniquely, is not a single ethnic or tribal or familial group. It is, from its beginning, um, a political association. And thus, it has a specific birthday, April the 21st, 753. So if we were to think about this, um, it's 180 degrees from the Greek mind, where Nicias on the shores of Syracuse would say, uh, go, you are the city, you, the people, the Deme, not the ships, not the walls, not the buildings, right? You are. Um, how many, you know, the people were, right? So the people are prior to the city, all right, in the Greek world and in the Egyptian world and in the Mesopotamian world. The people are prior to the city. What about Rome? How many Romans were there on April the 20th, 753 B.C.? None. You follow me? The way to think of this is how many North Carolinians were there before there was a state called North Carolina? None. There were people there, but they weren't North Carolinians, right? So um, it is not a single, it's not built up in the same way. And this process of the coming together of uh, different ethnicities, different tribes, people that were different enough to have different burial practices and worship different gods is a process that we know of as synoicism. It's a Greek word. It means a joining together, like synthetic, right? A synthesis. Um, synoicism. And they developed then from the get-go as this. Now, they had kings, but interestingly enough, the kings were elected. It was not a hereditary monarchy. The kings were elected from the beginning, uh, beginning with Romulus. And this is a period that lasts until 509 BCE when uh, the last king, the seventh king, according to tradition, an Etruscan named Tarquinius Superbus is expelled from the city and uh, the republic is formed. And the Roman Republic lasts until it falls completely apart um, at the close of the first century BCE with um, the usurpation of, of political power and political office. People like Julius Caesar figure prominently into that story. And uh, it collapses until it is reformed as a principate. They did not call it an imperial period. We call it that, the imperial age, which begins with Augustus Caesar in 31, um, uh, actually in 27 BCE. And then in... Um, the question is the fall, the decline of Rome. So you can see from the peak population here of about 1.3 million, around 300 A.D., that it declines precipitously over the next 100 years. And uh, eventually, by about 1,000 A.D., it, it goes from a population of over a million to a population of about 50,000. That is a, a complete collapse of a city. And uh, there are wolves uh, baying at the, at the doors of the, of the buildings of Rome at the time. And we will talk a little bit about that. Um, many historians uh, have said the two greatest problems in the history of Western civilization is the account of the rise of Rome, of these um, robbers who became farmers, these farmers who became generals, these generals who became statesmen and philosophers, uh, and these statesmen and philosophers who became real estate developers, controlling a territory that would stretch from modern-day Scotland to modern-day Iraq and from the north shore of the Black Sea in the south of Russia to the Atlantic Ocean 
in what is now Morocco. That is a vast territory larger than the continental United States, um, and it was not all under the military rule of a bunch of soldiers. The, this was a multi-ethnic, cosmopolitan uh, universe, and we'll see some, some elements of that um, later on. So the question then is the account of the rise of Rome, and in some ways I think that is simpler than the account of the fall of Rome. We, uh, I don't think Hollywood would have us believe that it all fell <coughs> to the barbarians in 476. These people were completely, complete maniacs. They had lead poisoning, all this kind of stuff, crazy stuff. Um, it just got too big and it got too complicated and it could no longer be managed is what happened, I think. But it broke up into a, a thousand pieces, uh, little pieces, and those little pieces emerged um, as the modern world. So I think it's still with us in a very reasonable way, so that if we are able to track um, Fifth and West Peachtree back, we will end up in Rome. We can't take it back further than that. Um, this is um, Bronze Age Italy in the north, northern Italy from Rome north, up to Venice at the top. And you'll notice a line that can almost be drawn between Rome and Venice, the modern locations of those cities, uh, north-south, in which on the right side, inhumation means the burial of the corpse as a whole. And on the left side, we see cremation as a burial practice. Now, if you have groups of people who are sufficiently different to have two different burial practices, you have two very different sort of cultures. This is tribally organized, and um, the Villanovan people simply are called that because the first 19th century excavations that revealed um, these urns, these hut urns that we'll see in a moment, came from a place called Villanova. Um, they didn't call them that. We don't know what they were called. They had no writing. Uh, but they buried their dead in this cremation, in these cremation urns that we see here in these sort of jars that are called dolia, and um, the little uh, hut that we see, the little cremation urn where the ashes are kept, is interesting because it is a model of their house, of their houses. So they built first these little terracotta clay models of their houses, and then they actually built it out of, made them out of bronze, and um, these were actually buried in the ground. This will become significance in the as we go along here today. So just keep that in mind. Here's a bronze one um, on the right. And these uh, actually have been excavated in Rome. Actually, the one on the right um, excavated on the Palatine Hill in Rome. Others have been found in the Roman Forum, the ones on, on the left. Okay, So Rome was at the southern end of this Villanovan culture. Now, uh, sometime around 750, 800, uh, BCE, another group comes into the southern portion of this Villanovan culture, and these people are called Etruski or Etruscans in the modern term. Uh, that's not what they call themselves. Uh, that is what we call them. And for 200 years or more, there has been great controversy about the origin of the Etruscans. Who were they? Where did they come from? In general, there are two schools of thought. The first school of thought is that they were simply an octonous, indigenous population that developed out of the Villanovan uh, culture. However, the Greek historian Herodotus um, actually claimed that they came from Turkey. They came from Anatolia, and actually specifically from Lydia on the southern coast of Turkey. Um, and this controversy has raged for a long time. The evidence for um, the indigenous, uh, you know, when suddenly you have another culture that displaces an earlier one, let's say the Native American population in North Carolina when the British showed up, for example, there is some evidence, particularly in the Mediterranean, of some sort of um, a violent takeover, a burning of cities, uh, a charcoal layer, uh, things that can be dated to specific periods of time that would indicate that some exogenous group came in and conquered these people. That is absent in the material record. You don't have any evidence of that. Um, however, the 
uh, the problem with this developing is that unlike the Latin tribes to the south, um, they did not speak, the Etruscans did not speak an Indo-European language, nor did they speak a Semitic language. So that is explained by perhaps they were, um, what, they were some pre-Indo-European language group like Basque that's today in northern Spain, southern France, that um, is, they see themselves as separate and they speak their actual dialect is not based in either in any known language group existent in the world today. Not a Ugaritic language, not a Semitic language, uh, none of the Afroasiatic languages, none of the Indo-European languages. So the question is then, well, you know, who are they? And so some enterprising, um, <laughs> enterprising um, professors at University of Pisa who were involved in genomic, human genome research, got together and said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, let's do a mitochondrial DNA analysis and see, see where it matches. Okay? It's fascinating. Um, get to that in a moment. So as the Etruscans developed, um, they influenced and would influence Rome a great deal, particularly with their religion. Um, and they spread northward, and they organized themselves into ten cities. Now, we, we can decipher their language, but they left us no literature, so we don't have a Homer. We don't have the, a Bible. We don't have any uh, text, you know, even the kinds of things that are written on the walls of monumental architecture in Egypt. We don't have that. What we have are lists of things. So it's about like having um, the Yellow Pages you know, in the phone book. I mean, you don't know what to make of this. What you know is so-and-so sold mufflers and, and did breaks, right? But you don't know anything else about them. Um, so as the Etruscans expanded, and they would last until they were completely subsumed by the Romans, um, really around 300 B.C., but finally the last gasp of Etruria was in about 100 B.C., um, they ran up cheek by jowl with these Umbrian tribes and Sabine tribes and Latin tribes that were to the east and the south of the Etruscans. The Etruscans also had two cities in the south in contact with the Greek world. So these enterprising um, professors at the University of Pisa mapped the mitochondrial DNA of some Etruscan remains. Uh, they mixed it in actually with some medieval burials of people in Tuscany. And um, then they mapped it, and it turns out that these people came from Mesopotamia up through the Euphrates-Tigris Valley and then into Anatolia, and Herodotus apparently was right. And so then everybody came out and said, whoa, no, 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 no. Uh, you can't do this. this. The remains are 2,000 years old, more, 3,000 years old. You don't know. It's contaminated. Well, it turned out that there was a species of cattle that lives only today, that lives only in Tuscany today. You don't find it anywhere else in Italy. And they seized upon that, and they extracted the DNA from the cattle, and then they mapped that, and guess where it came from? It matched perfectly this area that we see right here in southern Turkey. Herodotus was right. So the current theory, and this is only in the last decade or less, is that some exogenous element, from Turkey, from this Greek world in the eastern Mediterranean, <coughs> not Greek-speaking, but from that sort of perhaps a little Hittite in there somewhere, perhaps a little, um, you see this match right here and right here, and you can sort of see where um, the, the greatest number of hits were, that in fact... Um, some exogenous element entered into this Villanovan area north of Rome, led by a man named Tyrannus. Uh, the Tyrrhenian Sea is actually apparently named after him. And um, somehow they merged in with this Villanovan culture. They brought with them superior technologies, perhaps brought with them Iron Age implements and technologies and so forth. We do know that the Etruscans, from the material record, could actually um, 
smelt gold into, they could atomize gold, aerate it, and make gold wire and gold, just absolutely gorgeous jewelry. You wouldn't believe how beautiful the jewelry is. And they learned how to do this apparently by blowing coal dust into fires that could get the fires up to about 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very, very hot. Um, Bronze Age civilization did not have that technology. So apparently they came in and somehow these two groups mixed together and formed this uh, distinct culture that wrote in a very peculiar way. This is their language. The evidence for the a sort of Eastern Turkey, Eastern Mediterranean origin is the fact that um, their script is actually based on Euboean Greek, a sort of archaic form of Greek, but it was written not left to right, right to left like a Semitic language, like Arabic or Hebrew. Not this way to this way, but this way to this way. Follow me? They inflected the letters, and then they wrote them right to left. The whole sentence is right to left rather than left to right, uh, which is indicative of a, some sort of Semitic or Eastern Mediterranean uh, influence. They also practiced liver divining. What in the world is liver divining? Well, it was practiced in Mesopotamia and Babylonia. And uh, it was a practice of before undertaking a significant event like the founding of a city or the establishment of a colony or going to war, um, you would actually um, sacrifice an animal to your gods and then you would extract the intestines and you would read the liver, right? It's called augury. And uh, I've written some stuff in, in there today on this and you should read that. This is actually the Piacenza liver, which is a model for the people who did this to understand, to learn how to read the livers. It's a little thing. It's not this big. It's about that big around. And uh, it represents the heavens and the abodes of the various gods. Um, one more example of the peculiarity of this language. Um, the high god of Rome was Jupiter. Now, there was no J in the Latin alphabet originally, so it was I-U. Wherever you see a, a J, you need to substitute an I. And it was pronounced E-U. So Julius would have been Iulius, all right? Uh, Jupiter would have been Jupiter. Now, if you go to Zeus, Zeus, and you sort of drop the Z, and you say Zeus the father very fast, Jupiter, 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 Right? There is some ancient Indo-European god, apparently, that was both Zeus and Jupiter. Right? The high god of, that's in the Latin world. The high god of, of, the, of the Etruscan pantheon was named Tin, T-I-N. Doesn't conform to any other sound or any other element in any place in the ancient world. Tin. However, there was another Etruscan goddess, Minerva, who later will be equated with Athena, much later. But she is Etruscan in origin. She's a goddess of wisdom, goddess of law and justice. And Minerva um, is uh, one of the triad of the three high Roman gods. Jupiter in the center, Minerva on his left, and his consort Juno um, on his, I'm sorry, Juno on his left and Minerva on his right. So in the Roman temples, of Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, we would always have three gods in the cella of the temple. Um, Juno will later be equated with uh, Hera. The, um, so going back to the writing, if you look at Euboean Greek on the left column and then you see the model Etruscan, you can see what they did. They turned the letters around. And then oddly, um, the Latin alphabet is derived from the Etruscan alphabet, except the Latins took it and turned it back around so that it, led, it read left to right. And so our modern English and most of the world, a um, good bit of the world, all of North and South America, for example, uses this, um, this alphabet, not to mention um, you know, what you're looking at right now. Uh, they buried their dead in uh, Tholos tombs, Tholos-like tombs that were partly cut into this volcanic stone called tufa, 
Most of what we know about the Etruscans comes from their burials. Uh, and from what we know, from the material record, we can, I would assume, in fact, I'm convinced they were an extremely happy people because whenever you see depictions of them, they're always smiling, they're always eating and drinking and dancing, and they had a concept of the afterlife of heaven, um, which um, was basically just like this world. So you see that this guy, who apparently liked to cook, had his tomb all decorated as a kitchen. This is actually a kitchen. You look at all the tongs and the cooking implements and the meat cleavers and the, the bundles of garlic and the bunches of tomatoes and everything growing around. I mean, it's amazing. It's so, you know, heaven is just like this world, only it's better, right? You know, food doesn't have any calories in it, right? That sort of thing. Um, and here's a very famous sarcophagus of um, the Etruscan sarcophagus, uh, fairly late, about 300 uh, BCE, which is actually 4th century, which is showing a husband and wife. Um, and what's missing is that he is holding a cup of wine. She is holding a plate with some bread. Uh, they are lying down for their evening meal. And uh, you look at their faces, happy as clams. Um, that's actually, they're all like that. In fact, you'll see these heads. You go in and just all these heads. And everyone has got this kind of smile on their face. Um, they were obviously influenced from about the 6th century on by Greek civilization, particularly in Magna Graeca particularly in uh, southern Italy, those colonies that were along the coast of southern Italy. They had the arch. They developed the arch. This is an Etruscan arch at Volterra. The Romans would later perfect this and, along with the plastic qualities of concrete to create uh, fairly expansive interior volumes like the Pantheon, for example, out of concrete. But it is, the, it is the Etruscans who gave uh, the world the arch. The, it, it actually was also in Babylon, but it wasn't used. Greeks knew about it, but they chose not to use it for whatever reason. Uh, the Etruscan temples relative to the Greek temples were very, very ungainly, to say the least. Um, they're originally, of course, out of wood and tufa. Here we see a model of one on the lower part, the um, figure of Apollo of Vei that we see, that's Rome's nearest neighbor, on the upper left actually stood on the ridge beam, um, that would be here on the ridge beam uh, of such a temple. And here we note the um, influence of the Etruscan world on Rome, uh, this model here for a Roman temple with its very pronounced front porch, its proneos, um, and its three-part cella. Uh, with the engaged walls, there's no peripteral or pseudo-peripteral style that you see as you do in the Greek world. It's derived from the Etruscan world. In fact, even the Capitoline She-Wolf, um, very famous, it stood on the Capitoline Hill, it still exists in the Capitoline Museums, is Etruscan in origin, this thing that looks a bit like a dog, it's supposed to be a wolf. The two figures of Romulus and Remus were added in the Renaissance. Uh, they are not original. So this describes an art, architecture, political organization, and specifically religion and town founding, the influence of the Etruscan civilization on Rome. So by the middle of the 8th century, in the Iron Age, when Rome begins, uh, we have a map of Italy that looks something like this, with Campania south being uh, Greek, part of the Greek world, uh, to the north, the very powerful Etruscans. <coughs> to their east, the Sabines. And to their south, the Latins. Latin and Sabine sandwiched in between, the, the Latin sandwiched in between the Sabine world and the Etruscan world as we get close to Rome. There we see Vei, where the Apollo figure came from. Um, so it looks a little bit more like this, perhaps, with uh, Rome sort of being in this gap, in this interstitial space. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but uh, in the myths of Rome, they, they were very insecure about their own origins. They, didn't, they were vague about it. They didn't know, and it would not be until the age of Augustus and the dawn of the imperial age and the close of the Republic that they would actually write down these sort of epic poems like Virgil's Aeneid that uh, then gave them a sort of myth of origin. The, um, it's, um, 
again, not going to read this except to say that Aeneas was um, supposedly of the house of Troy. That means that he was part of that Ionian and Lydian sort of cultural sphere in the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And uh, according to Virgil, uh, Romulus and Remus, an old folk tale that had been around for a long, long time, was actually then fused into um, the story of Aeneas that he makes up. Um, but it does perhaps have a kernel of memory, a kernel of truth in it, in the fact that um, we know now from this mitochondrial DNA that there was an exogenous element that came in north of Rome into this Villanovan world. And so it seems that Aeneas and the myth of Aeneas actually might uh, actually be derived from that. Romulus and Remus, on the other hand, are, uh, as I said, it's an old folk tale, and what Virgil does is to kind of merge these two together to give uh, the Roman people a sort of history that up to that point they really did not have. I won't, you, you're, you're supposed to read this yourselves. I think you'll find it interesting. This is from Plutarch. But I want to, um, and you all know that, that Rome is founded basically when, in fratricide, when Romulus kills his brother Remus uh, after he leapt across um, the pomerium or the ditch of the boundary of the city that Romulus was plowing. And, um, but there's a part of this here that, that is, is very important, so I'm going to read it. Romulus buried Remus together with his foster brothers in the Ramonia, and then set himself to building his city. After summoning from Tuscany, from Etruria, men who prescribed all the details in accordance with certain sacred ordinances and writings, and taught them to him as in religious rite, as a religious rite. A circular trench was dug around what is now the Comitium, and in this were deposited the first fruits of all things, the use of which was sanctioned by custom as good and by nature as necessary. And finally, every man brought a small portion of the soil from his native land, and these were cast among the first fruits and also locks of hair, we know from Varro, into this hole in the ground, and they were promiscuously mixed, symbolically mixing this group with that group with this group with that group, and then burying it as if we were planting a garden. You follow me? As if we were planting a garden. Um, they call this trench, as they do the heavens, by the name of Mundus. Then taking this as a center, they marked out the city in a circle around it, and the founder, having shod a plow with a brazen plowshare, bronze, and having yoked it to a bull and a cow, himself drove a deep furrow around the boundary lines, while those who followed after him had to turn the clods, which the plow threw up inwards toward the city, and suffer that no clod lie outside of this plowed boundary. With this line, they mark out the course of the wall, and it is called by contraction pomerium, that is, post murum, behind or next to the wall, and where they proposed or purposed to put in a gate, there they took the share out of the ground, lifted the plow over, and left a vacant space. And this is the reason why they regard all the wall as sacred except for the gate. But if they held the gate sacred, then it would not be possible without religious scruples to bring into and send out of the city the things which are necessary and yet unclean. So prior to habitation, a ritual was performed. This ritual was, the purpose of the ritual was to unite the heavens with the earth, uh, what was called the templa, the four templa of the sky, to be brought down to the templum of the earth. And then a hole was dug called a mundus. In French, the word monde, which is derived from that, means what? World. World. A world was born. Um, now, there's a story here about the rape of the Sabine, and you should read this on your own. It's fascinating. Um, basically, in a nutshell, uh, Romulus and his merry men over on the Palatine suddenly wake up one day and say, you know, we're not going to get very far as a people because we don't have any wives. And if you want to have children, you have to have wives. 
So I said, what are we going to do about this? They said, well, the Sabines over there have lots of wives, lots of daughters. So we're going to throw a big party, and then we're going to run off with their wives. And their and they do that, according to the story, according to the myth. Um, well, did that happen in, as a single event? No. Um, but um, it probably did happen over several hundred years. It probably happened with intermarriage where between Latin and Sabine, where Sabine aristocracy was horrified of the fact that their daughters might in fact be wanting to marry these rude Latin thugs over here on the Palatine. Got me? However, as we'll see, there is material evidence that this did occur. Well, the important thing is that um, the Sabines go back to go to war, go to battle to get their wives back and their daughters back. But they've been over there for a while, and they're pretty happy. They say, these are good guys. Right? They're not bad. So the battle begins. The Roman people flee, or the Latin people flee under Romulus. Jupiter throws a thunderbolt, stops them. They come back. They get bogged down in what is now the Forum, which was then a swamp. And um, when all of a sudden the women on the Palatine, the daughters and wives of the Sabines, come out. In fact, the daughter of the Sabine king, who is married to Romulus now, Hercilia is her name, comes out. And they have torn their clothes, and they have pulled their hair, and they have put mud on their faces, and they are moaning and weeping and crying and saying, stop, stop, stop. Wouldn't it be better if we just all shook hands and became friends? Right? That's why I say, no, that didn't happen. It may have happened over several hundred years. The Sabine king says, hmm, you know, you might be right. So the Sabine king, Titus Tatius, and the Latin king, Romulus, shake hands, and they agree that they will form uh, a new city called Rome, and they will live happily ever after. And then they plow the comitium and so forth, and that's where this occurs. In fact, the assembly space, the comitium, occurred on this spot. Well, let's go back and see what the material record actually has to say about this. Um, if we look at the geography of the Tiber as it flows through what is today Rome, you'll notice that there's an island here uh, in the center of it. Very important at this point in time in the Iron Age was salt. And the salt trade was very important in this part of the world. It was the only thing you had to preserve meat. Um, we didn't have refrigeration, obviously, and the only way you could preserve meat and keep it from being uh, eaten by bacteria and worms and spoiling and so forth was to pack it in salt. And then you had to desalt it before you actually cooked it. Um, but still, you know, anybody from Virginia, Smithfield hams, you still have to do that, right? You, Soak it for overnight to get the salt out because that's how it's actually preserved. It's very salty. Um, so salt trade uh, occurred down around what later would become Rome's first colony, Ostia. And um, it moved up this side of the Tiber. And then to get it into the wealthier parts, to get it up into Etruria, it had to pass through, across the river here, right there, which was the first place where you could walk across, the, the natural ford. And then um, it moved up along here into Etruria, but it had to pass through Sabine territory. The Latin people were in control of the Palatine, Aventine, and possibly the Capitoline Hill, where this small stream flowed in right at that ford. So if you could control that river crossing, you could exact a toll, right, on this salt trade. You could make money. Um, but it had to get up through Sabine territory to get into Etruria. So I would speculate, and this is me speculating, I think most people would agree with me, that over a several hundred year period, up here, this is this hill, Kirinal, that's a thousand feet right down there, all right? So this is not very far. It's from here to maybe the Klaus building right, or well, the Clough Undergraduate Learning Center, uh, was Sabine territory. In fact, Quirinus was the high Sabine god. And um, at some point, they must have formed an association that was in their mutual economic interest. 
and um, they began then to control the salt trade uh, as it passed. So we have Latins on the south, we have Sabines here. We're not sure who controlled the Capitoline, and there's some indication that there was an Etruscan ele element on the Chilean hill. The area in between the Palatine and the Capitoline, where the Comitium would be formed, was here in this stream that flowed through an area called the Velabrum. Uh, this is where the Forum would develop, and this is where those burials that I described earlier uh, were found. Now, according to the myth of Romulus and Remus, um, the usurper at Alba Longa, the city supposedly founded by Aeneas, um, had expelled the twins like Moses in the bulrushes. You know, he had wanted them dead. So he hired uh, somebody, and the river was in flood. To, he could take them up and drown them in the river. So he went up river, but the river was in flood, and he couldn't get to the river, so he set the basket afloat, assuming that they would... Well, they didn't. They ran into high ground, and they were discovered by a wolf somewhere about right here, and they were brought into a cave somewhere believed to be about right here, never confirmed for sure where it is, called the Lupercal. And here the twins were suckled by a wolf and fed by a woodpecker. Um, that is, um, that didn't happen. But this means that this area was venerated throughout the Roman period, time period, as being sort of a sacred site. Their architecture was very primitive. Um, there we see um, one of these huts that's been reconstructed from a Villanovan hut urn. And um, there was one of these constructed by Augustus on the Palatine Hill adjacent to his house, adjacent to Augustus' own house, which he proclaimed to be the house of Romulus, the house of the founder. You'll notice that um, it has a kind of front porch, that um, this space that we see here in front, uh, this was called a fora, a fora. It meant to look out, to foresee, before, still embedded in English, before, F-O-R-E, fora. There we see the foundations of these huts that were excavated in 1902 on the corner of the Palatine Hill, which uh, is known as a Germalis, which means twins, like Gemini. And it was here that Romulus would presumably plow out the boundary of his city, his pomerium. The archaeological map that we see of that corner today shows um, the house of Augustus, complex here, the house of his wife Livia that we see here, datable to about 20 B.C. Um, and then these older, this area here, a kind of archaeological park, and the assumption was the Lupercal was always here. In 2007, it was discovered to be here, although there's still controversy of whether or not that was, in fact, what it was. I would urge you to read these also materially in 1980, portions of a wall datable to the middle of the 8th century uh, has been discovered. So if we build this up, we see then over time that the capital line becomes the arcs or the citadel, like the Acropolis of the ancient Greek city. The Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus at E will be built there, and the saddle in between the higher hill, D, with the Temple of Juno Moneta, is where our word money comes from, uh, that flat saddle in between was called the asylum, the asylum, because there Romulus grew the population by offering all the bandits and thieves and all the displaced people in the Umbrian world and in the Sabine world and the Latin world asylum uh, in Rome. Come and join us, he said. We will have to leave off there. And we will pick up this uh, lecture with the formation of the House of the King and the establishment of the Forum, the Law Courts, the Basilica, all of the major public building components of the Roman city. And then we will move and see how the, all of this is carried out time and time and time again in these colonial cities, thousands of these colonial cities, which the Romans built over a very long period of time. Okay?